Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the palm and rose where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. I told you about some of my Bigfoot sightings in episode 10, and Vic was kind enough to invite me back to share a little bit more with you. So I thought I would do that. Um, right now, it's, it's a very crazy time here. The Bigfoots, they're people, they have their own culture, their own way of life, their own way of doing things. And their ways are not ours. And they do manage and run their lives different than we do. And so there are periodic spurts where due to their own business with their own culture, it's quiet. It's not necessarily seasonal. But they do have time periods where they're they're gone and they're quiet and then they pop back up. Right now is an exceptionally crazy time. And I, I don't know what they're working on or, or what the deal is, but they are loud and proud. They are all over the place. So we've had quite a few sleepless nights here. They're not being aggressive in any way, shape, or form. They're not being damaging. They're not hurting anybody. They are just making sure that their presence is known. A normal night at my house is things hitting the wall of the house, not aggressively, more like a knock, just kind of like, hey, we're here. Um, sometimes we get the kids that will get up on the roof. It's not uncommon to see me outside of my house in the middle of the night telling everybody to get their little hairy tushies off my roof because if there's any damage, there is going to be a big problem on this end. But, you know, they haven't done any damage. The old house I had in Michigan, they pulled the skirting off the bottom of the trailer and they would get under that. But where I'm at right now, it's a stick built house and it's built on brick that is five feet off the ground because I'm in the South, we get hurricanes. And then from there, the window hits and it goes another five feet. So from the top of the window to the ground is actually 10 feet. It is extremely normal here to wake up in the middle of the night or even, you know, walk into the bedroom during the day or at night and see somebody standing outside of the window. And most of them actually will cover the full 10 feet from the grass to the top of the window. And then, of course, they're wider than the window. Occasionally, we get some that are smaller than that, that are more the adolescents, and they just walk by. My husband walked in the bedroom and sat down to do something the other night. He was sitting on the edge of the bed. And he just happened to look up in the windows right there and one had walked directly in front of the window and he, you know, kind of looked out after and just walked off into the bushes. I always tell everybody, welcome to my freak show, because that's generally what we have going on. Last night, I have my daughter and son-in-law staying with us for a while and their bedroom is on the second floor where we're on the first floor. And they called my phone at midnight and said, Mom, you left the dogs outside. I have an animal rescue, so I have a lot of dogs. And everybody comes in the house at night. Nobody stays outside. And I said, no, I'm sure all the dogs are in. And they said, no, the dog's out on the back porch barking. And they've gotten it down to a science. You know, they can imitate any noise, any voice, any sound with such accuracy. You would never ever suspect that it was them and they've learned how to imitate each individual bark from each dog so it's not like a generalized bark it's actually specific for each one and we have a rescue that we got three or four years ago named chase and when chase feels that he's not getting enough attention he will literally sit out in the backyard until i walk out there squat down, tell him mommy will carry him in the house and then he'll climb in my arms and I carry him in because he's a spoiled brat. 
And my son-in-law said, mom, I'm telling you, Chase is in the backyard. I said, he, he can't be in the backyard. We brought him in. I got up. I looked. Of course, Chase wasn't out there. I go back inside. He was sleeping next to the bed. And my son-in-law called me again. He said, Chase is back out on the back porch. I said, I was just there. There's nothing on the back porch. So I went out. I checked again. I look like an idiot. I'm walking around in the back. No, no dogs. And they were running a muck out there last night. They were whipping and running back and forth across the yard. They were running up to the back of the fenced in because half my backyard is fenced in for the dogs. The other half is open because the Bigfoots like to run around back there. And then we have a bonfire pit back there. And then they would run up the side of the property, which is all brush because I live in the woods. It's all brush and trees and pine trees. And they would come up right next to the dog pen. Well, Igor Borstep, when he was here a few years ago, we had bought, or he had bought actually, a pair of night vision goggles. And you can take pictures and record and everything. And when he went to leave, I really enjoyed him. And he said, I'll leave it here for when I'm here. Because he, when he's in the States, he generally stays with me. And so my son-in-law's had that out for three days. And he's done nothing but watch them run around and play in the backyard. Last night, before him and my daughter had gone up to bed, he was out there and he got a view of two of them. He could see the facial features, the hair, the brow ridge, the skin on the face, all of it. it you know, I mean, it, it's just amazing. But they seem to be quite happy here. We don't have any aggression problems. I, I've been fortunate. I have been called to different areas in the United States to help with some that were aggressive and deal with that. But you know, nothing terribly, terribly disturbing. But the ones that have been around me have always been kind. I, I've not had that issue. If possibly any were to come in that were not what they would consider to be pure of heart, they've been very helpful. Um, I had one instance in Michigan where we had one that came in and they literally pelted it with rocks until it left. And after that, everything was calm again. Where I'm at right now, we have three different clans that actually will meet up and come into this area and at my house. And then we have a mother and her mate and her child. And I think the child now is probably maybe five or six. So he's a big boy now. And he continually is running around the front yard. And I have a pan that is bolted to my banister that I put food in for feral cats because where I'm at, the feral cat problem is just terrifying. And they come up there and they get food and he's figured this out. So it's not uncommon to go my front door. I have my big door and I have glass panels on either side of the door and above it. It's not uncommon to get up in the middle of the night and look out that window and see him on the porch. As soon as he realizes you're watching, of course he takes off, but that's not uncommon. The other night they were playing with the cars. You know, we would be in the house and we'd look outside. All of a sudden the lights were on inside the car. We'd go out, we'd turn them off. We'd go in the house, we'd look out, the lights were on on the inside of the car. And handprints everywhere. And my daughter especially, she's got this little tiny blue Honda and it's blue. They love that car. Every time that car is here, it's pelted with handprints, oily handprints. They do that with my Jeep. We had went to dinner with a friend of mine and I had just washed it and it was home for in just a matter of an hour. And we went to go get in the car and I'm like, I didn't even realize they had been out in the yard. My clean car was covered in handprints and they do have like a, a bit of an oily texture on their hands. And so when they leave a handprint, it, it stays for long periods of time. I mean, it's hard to get that oil off your vehicle. And a friend of mine, she lives like 10, 15 minutes from me. And she did not realize that she had them that were coming up in her backyard. Up until she met me, she really didn't know that much about them. And I was over at her house one day and I had found a bunch of footprints. And I said, no, they're, you know, you've got them here as well. And she has German shepherds and she's got some white ones and they absolutely adore her white German shepherd. White to them is a sign of purity. And they really hold anything white in very high regards. And she has this room attached to her house that the dogs are in. And she's forever 
finding giant handprints all over the door to that from the outside going in where they'll literally put their hands on it and lean up against the door and the windows to watch them. And she has a porch off of there and she had all kinds of stuff on that porch. Everything from a generator to dog crates to shelves to wood, whatever. And she got up one day and all of that was off the porch and out in the yard. She has no idea what they were looking for, but they had pulled everything off that porch and dumped it in the yard. And she had had about four years ago, she had a pair of, I guess you would call them rose bush clippers, the big long ones. And they just disappeared. She had not been able to ever find them again. And then like a month and a half ago, she went out her door and they sat on her porch. They had brought them back. I don't know what they did with them while they had them, but they were back and there was all kinds of footprints on the ground where they had walked when they brought them. But she had two foster dogs because she does the animal rescue with my husband and I. And two of them turned on her one day out in her yard. And she's an older woman. She's 66 years old. She's just a beautiful, beautiful person. And these two dogs attacked her and tried to pull her on the ground. They would have killed her. They almost did. And the female had hold of her leg and was vigorously shaking her leg. And the male was trying to grab her other leg to pull her out on the ground. And the Bigfoots were in the woods that butts up to her property. And they are the only reason she's still alive. They started throwing things and growling and and making noises. And they got the dogs to leave her alone. Otherwise, they would have killed her. There was nobody that was coming to help her. They had acted aggressively, the dogs had, for a few days. And she went out to clean their pen and to let them run. And she actually had taken a handgun with her. It was in her pocket. And when they attacked, she couldn't shoot at them because they were shaking her legs so violently. She was afraid she'd shoot herself. So she was shooting up in the air, which normally that would have made the Bigfoot scatter. Instead, they actually came and they were right outside of her fence hooting and hollering and throwing things and it's we believe just because of the events that happened that was the reason the dogs backed off because the dogs got terrified and just dropped her and got out of there and got them off of her had they not done that she would have never lived because they were those two dogs were determined they were going to kill her so and, and of course we immediately got the dogs removed but they can be very helpful <laughs> when you when you need them we had a huge 40 foot pine tree on the side of our house that it, when we moved in, it was up right, but it was kind of flimsy and we had hurricane. uh, It was when Michael came in Florence and it was hurricane Florence. And I was so worried about that tree because had it gone down, it would have landed on my garage, which has a bonus room above it. And I I talked to my husband and we had only been in this house, not even but a few weeks. And we didn't have anything here with us. Most of our belongings were still in Michigan. And I said, you know, we've got to get this tree down before the storm, because if not, it's going to take out the house. It's not going to stay up during a hurricane. And I thought, you know, I don't know what to do. So as a joke, I stood outside on my deck and I said, okay, you guys, if you're out there, I could really use the assist on this. Like that tree is going to take out the bonus room in the garage. And I went back in the house. I never thought anything more about it. We were in the garage and getting some things done before the hurricane hit. And we heard this whooshing sound and the window in the garage was open and this huge breeze just came wafting into the garage. And I thought, what in the world? And I went outside, there was, you know, I'm like, what is going on? The tree had not only come down, but it didn't break on its own. Not only was it down, it had been moved five foot past where the stump was and about 10 foot behind it. That is not possible. Like if a tree is going to fall, it's going to fall forward, sideways, whatever, but it's going to fall down from the stump. This was actually five foot over and approximately 10 foot behind the stump. So whatever put it down was very deliberate in how they did it because it wasn't even anywhere near the base. And the inside of it, where it had been broken, was all fresh wood. I mean, it wasn't like the tree was dead. The leaves were still green. And then to make it even more crazy was the tip of that tree was snapped 
like if it would have fallen down, it was snapped the opposite way it should have snapped. And Igor Borstev had come out right directly after the hurricane. And he saw it. He was just dumbfounded. It, it just literally blew him away the way it was done. It was snapped and moved exactly how it needed to so that it did not hit my house. So, I mean, they can be very helpful. Does that mean that they'll help every time you ask them to? 100% no. Like, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, I certainly have no control over what they do. But they've proven themselves to be good to me so many times over the years. I, I can't even tell you. And, you know, I try to be good to them, too. Like I said, they're a type of people. They're not all good. They're not all bad. Not any different than what we are. You know, we have people that are less than perfect, whether, you know, it's psychotic or mentally impaired, murderers, whatever. They're people, it's not any different. Primarily, they are good. They just want to live their lives. They have speech. You can, I mean, they'll talk. They're not going to go out there and talk in our language as quickly as I do. It's very guttural. It comes from deep down in the clavicle and the chest. And it's very gurgled. They have their own language, but they can speak in ours as well. It's slower because it's, you know, they're talking a different language. But if you listen carefully, it's hard to understand because it is so deep. Igor was here one day sitting at his desk and he thought I had been up at 5 a.m. And he's like, why were you talking outside of the window? Because again, the windows are five feet off the ground. So you know, you could be under there and nobody would know. And it was actually them. We found footprints on the ground and he couldn't understand what they were saying. I think there was probably more than one and they were talking to each other. They used to sit under my window. Well, they have since I've been here as well, but even in Michigan, they would sit under the window and I'd hear them talk to each other, but it was all in their language, which it sounds almost like a gibberish because it's so fast. And I, I used to hear him talk all the time, or, or I would go out in the woods and you'd hear him talk to each other. And then my kids would go outside and they would hear my voice in the woods and I would have been in the house. The rule of thumb at our house was you don't go in the woods if you hear me call you. I don't care if it does sound like my voice, you never go. If you don't physically see me, you don't respond. It's just because you don't know. They're that good at imitating absolutely everything. I've had in Michigan four foot of snow on the ground and I would hear bullfrogs. I mean, just crazy things like that. But we do get a lot of sightings, especially, you know, I want to say more in the backyard, but that's really not true because I've had just as many in the front yard. They come in from all sides and I've got woods on all sides of me. I do have a neighbor on each side, but we're separated by pine trees and bushes and they get in those pine trees and bushes, and then they go from property to property. And my next door neighbor, I did tell the one gal, be prepared. I don't want you to be frightened. I don't want you to be panicked. But whoever lives next to me, it's a given. I mean, I'm, I always apologize to everybody. I'm like, I'm sorry. They're just going to show up. And they do. The dogmen as well. We've not had any issues with them either. They've been just lovely. They were good in Michigan for me. They've been good here. We just don't have that problem with any of them. But yeah, they've been very active here. They jump over the fence. I have a five-foot fence, and that's nothing to them. And you'll catch them in the backyard. They can do a belly crawl. And it really, for anybody that hasn't seen it, it looks extremely similar to when the Scooby-Doo cartoons were on, and he would get on his take his hands and his feet and he'd go low and you'd hear that ding, 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 ding noise. And that's pretty much what they do. And they can move at the speed of light that way. I mean, it's, it's so fast. You can't even believe it. And we've had them do that across the backyard or even in the backyard where the dogs go, but they get in there all the time. They are forever going and getting things to toss into the backyard for the dogs. And we had one night, there was a black male out there and he wasn't overly huge. He was like maybe seven, seven foot. And he was, I mean, he's built bigger than a normal man, but he wasn't built as big as a lot of them I've seen. And he was at the back right behind the fence and he went across the back fence and then he went into my neighbor's yard by her shed. 
And I had seen him. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. I had looked out and he was out there walking across. And then the next day, when I put the dogs out, I had walk. I always walk out in the yard and check to make sure they haven't talked because the Bigfoot's put all kinds of stuff in the yard for the dogs. And I'm continually worried that they're going to put something in there the dogs can get hurt on. So I do a random check. I do a walk around the yard every day to make sure there's nothing there. The whole yard was completely clear. There was nothing in there. And I heard them out there and they just, they have a certain bark. They bark when the Bigfoots are around and they were going off. And I looked out there and here the dogs are dragging a two by four around the backyard. There were no two by fours out there. I'd already checked the yard. And I don't even know where this two by four came from. It looked very weathered, but the dogs had it. They were biting at it and dragging it around. And so whatever it was, it had gotten tossed over the fence into them. I've gone out there and found shoes that I don't know where in the world these came from tossed over there. We have a septic tank that had wood stakes on it. They're like a two and a half foot wood stake just so that we know where it's at. And it's not inside the fenced in area. It's a good six feet outside of it. And I looked out one day in the Pyrenees is playing with this stick. And I thought, where did she get that? Because there were no sticks in the backyard. Because I'm always afraid if they chew on them, they'll get the splinters from the wood in their throat. So I go out there and I get it from her. And I'm like, this looks really familiar. And I look over by the septic tank and they had pulled the stake out over there and tossed it in the backyard for the dogs. I mean, I'll go out there, big old bones off deer or whatever in my backyard. I've had flower pots show up there. Why they thought they want to play with the flower pot, I have no idea. Just random things that will just end up there. But this is all normal here. I had one when I first moved here. I had been here all of like maybe 24 hours. And I started getting woke up about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And I always sleep with my windows open so I can listen for them. And it sounded like a whippoorwill. And I didn't know that much about whippoorwills at the time. I recorded it and I sent it to a friend of mine that does. And she said, no, that's definitely the noise of a whippoorwill. But she said, the timing of when they're doing this is really odd. And I said, well, yeah. And the noise is coming from nine feet off the ground inside the trees. Like it was coming from the woods across from my, my house. And it was, the voice was coming like nine foot off the ground. So I'm sure, and they stand in those, it's a pine tree farm and they stand in there in the tree lines and they climb up the trees all the time. So it would go out there and it would make the whippoorwill noise to me. And I would try to imitate it and make it back. And it got to be a game. And we did this every night for like three nights. And then the whippoorwill would, it was like it was pasting. The noise was coming, whatever it was making the noise, it was pasting back and forth and back and forth. And then when it was done and it was just over with it, that same whippoorwill noise would continue coming up high, but then it would go all the way through that tree line, all the way down the road. And you'd hear it walking away, making the whippoorwill noise all the way down there. Now, my son-in-law, he was outside last night, and they were making huffing noises and, and footsteps. He went out there today, and I thought I had seen one duck into the bushes. And he came back in, and he said something was making. It wasn't really a growl. It was like a grunt. And I said, yeah. I said, I thought that there was one out there. But now the baby that comes up here, and he, he's not that old, but he's very tall now. I mean, he's at least five foot plus. And he's got to be only six to seven years old. But the mom ran up the property the one time. He always plays out in the bushes out front in the whole strip. All parts of my property are outlined with bushes and pine trees. And they've made tunnels through there. They haven't made the tunnels this year, but they will. They do it every year. And he plays and he runs up and down through those tunnels. And then he climbs the tallest pine tree. Well, he's broken that pine tree all apart. It's just a disaster. And now he goes in the front part of my yard and he, I have a big oak tree and he gets in or maple tree and he gets up in that. But he was out there playing one day and Igor was here and Igor had went over there and the baby was gone. But he got in that tunnel that they made through there. And I knew they'd get mad. I made Igor get out because I, I said, you know what? She's going to be mad when mom gets in there and it smells like you. So he left and that night she came in and all I saw was this massive Bigfoot run down the property, but 
she had like salt and pepper hair, which I already knew that was her coloration. And she dove in those bushes and she was so mad. She was hooting and hollering. And all of a sudden the bushes are shaking and shaking because she was mad. And so he never went and got back in there again. I mean, that's the area where her little boy plays and she's not about to let anybody in it, but she's never tried to hurt anybody. I mean, nobody's ever been ran out. They've never charged anybody or even threw a rock at anybody over here. They get really excited when people acknowledge that they're here. And I think part of the reason they're so keyed up right now is my daughter. They absolutely adore my daughter. They've The Bigfoots have been around my daughter since she was little, not at this house, but at other houses. And like myself, wherever she ends up, they show up. And I think her and my son-in-law are here. And he's very, very interested in them. He saw Bigfoot the night that they moved out here. He saw his first Bigfoot. He was coming down the road to the house and he was only like not even a half a block away, but on our road. And one stepped out from behind the tree and he saw it and then it stepped back in behind the tree. So he was very well aware. He was aware that they existed before him, but that was his first sighting. Since he's been here and it's only been since last week, I can't even tell you how many he's seen. I mean, but they're excited because he wants to have contact with them and they're always running around here anyway. They've never been very shy. The neighbors have seen them. People up the road have seen them. They, I, it's one of those things that people don't talk about even when they do see them. And the ones that know me, when they see them, they'll come and tell me, Hey, I saw him, you know, walk back this way or it went this way or whatever. But it's fairly common. They'll come up on the porch or they'll leave gifts on the porch or, you know, my son-in-law left him out some M&Ms the other day. So I, I think most of the M&Ms were gone in the morning. They, this group here, or these groups, I guess, they don't take as much stuff as the ones that I had in Michigan. The ones in Michigan, no matter what I put out for them, they took. I do not recommend that. When I did it, you have to understand, I was on my own. I didn't have anybody that I knew that even had contact with them. I had found one person that owned Michigan Bigfoot on the internet and he's a very, very wonderfully kind man. So I didn't, I mean, after I had my initial, initial contact with him where he knew that I had them, it was years before I talked to them again. And so I still had all this ongoing contact. There's never been a time in my life that I didn't. And so when I contacted him again, that's how I met Igor Borsta. And I was already feeding them. It's just such a bad idea to do it. Depending on the clan that you're working with is whether or not you're safe because you can never feed them enough to fill them up. You're never, ever going to feed them enough. What you feed them is a snack and that's the best you can hope for. But what happens is they get to where they depend on it and they're a human, but they're more an uncivilized human. So when they don't get their way, they can get kind of crabby. And then if you ever were to stop that, then you could potentially get some very angry Bigfoot. So you just don't want to do it. Gifting is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Do feathers. White rocks. White is a sign of friendship for them. White rocks. You know, different things that you know they're not going to choke on. But it doesn't have to be a food product. We had a female in Michigan that had very long hair. And my daughter, she'd been outside. She'd brushed her hair and sent her hair brush on the porch. Forgot all about it. The next day, it was gone. They had already snagged it. And when they did, she brought it back. But unfortunately, when she brought it back, it was broken in half. Of course, there was some of their hair in it, which we used for Dr. Ketchum's study. But... When you give them a food source like that and you take it away, they can get crabby. I had, and I might have talked about this in episode 10, I had taken my children to church and I had planned on coming home and putting their food out. I put a ton of food out, okay? Number one, it's really costly because they've got a good appetite. But I put vegetables, I put the dog food out because they were always stealing the dog food. And scraps from dinner went out. I didn't put a lot of sweet things out. There are no dentists out there for them and they can get tooth decay. 
small amounts of sugar stuff is fine. They love cookies. They love candy bars. Just not a lot. You know, be mindful of the fact that they don't have a dentist and that tooth decay is a serious issue for them. And I took my kids to church planning to be back in time to put their food out. I put it out at the same time every night so they knew predictably when I was going to be there. And when I did it and I took the kids to church, I got asked to stay and help. So I did. And when I did that, I ended up getting back after the program was over. And that was 10 o'clock at night. We pulled in the yard and all the buckets, I had them on snaps that were on the trees. And they were the snaps that are actually like two claws that come together in the middle. It wasn't a standard snap because it's harder to get those off. And you have to have a thumb to unsnap them. You have to use your thumb and your first index finger. And every bucket that I had that was hung up out there was no longer on the trees hanging. They had been unsnapped, brought up on the porch and put upside down. Like, okay, idiot, you forgot to feed me. And when I got out of the car, they were just, they weren't aggressive. They were just loud. They were hooping and hollering like, okay, what happened? What happened? So I sent the kids in the house, went and got their food and put it out and they were fine. I mean, they, I didn't get any bad behavior other than they were vocal. And I mean, that particular clan, I never had where they were aggressive. And the only one that came in that was, they removed him throwing rocks at him. But they would go and sit out in the backyard. They'd sit Indian style and they'd look in the window into the kids' bedrooms or into the living room so that they could watch the TV. And I don't necessarily know they ever knew what they were watching as much as they saw people in the box and they had all these colors. But they were fascinated by it. And they would study it. I always tease everybody because it's like we're all out there studying them and the whole time they're actually studying us. So it is. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, gift if you want to, but try to be smart about it. You know, you don't want to get them dependent on you for any type of food or anything. I was very lucky with the group that I had here once in a great while. I might take some stuff out, but I don't do it on a predictable basis. I don't do it all the time. My son-in-law wanted to do it the other night because they had let him see him running around the backyard. So he thought it would be nice. And he put some, um, peanut butter M&Ms out there. And then he put some apples out there. But yeah, I mean, you can have positive interaction. And I stress this to a lot of people. I know so many researchers that will do things just to absolutely make them angry because then that way they have contact. That's not what you want. If you're going to have contact, you want to build on it. You want it based on respect. You want it based on a good relationship. So that you're not going to have just that one time sighting. You're going to have a lifetime of sightings and you're going to be able to have sightings that you can learn from about them and about their ways and their culture. So you want to make sure if you're going to do any of these things, if you want to get into the research or even if you don't, but you've had, you know, one sighting or whatever, you want it to be positive. And I think everybody, including myself, we really need to stay focused on that because I know people that will purposely go into areas where the aggressive ones are and they pretty much subdivide themselves to where the bad ones stay off by themselves, the good ones stay off by themselves, and they don't want to be bothered with each other. And people will purposely go in areas where they know that they're known to be aggressive because they think that'll make them mad enough that they'll come out and they'll get to see them. And it never ends well. Never. People can get hurt. People come up missing. And it's just not advisable. So if you're going to do this, if you want that contact, make sure you're trying to work towards the respective goal of being positive so that, you know, you can, if you enjoy it, you can continue with it or you can learn from them because they can be quite friendly and they can be really good. But the, I tell everybody this, the good ones have a deeper sense of love than what our people have any concept of. But the bad ones can be lethal. So if you go out there and you're trying for that negative contact just because you think it's funny and you'll get to see them, it doesn't end well for either side because they'll go out and they'll try to defend their area. And instead, 
people get scared and then everybody's out there with guns looking for them. And it's no fault of their own. They were off by themselves and our people are the ones that went after them. But we've just had so many different encounters. My husband almost died right after Christmas or right before Christmas. I'm sorry. And he was in the hospital and I had come home and they met me in the driveway and started pounding. On, one of them was pounding on a car. And I said, you know, he'll be back. I promise you he'll be back. They love my husband. And they're very emotional. They're calculated as far as how they live their lives for their own safety, but they can get really emotional. My neighbor has seen them multiple times now running around her yard. They go between my yard and her yard. There's still a lot of her flower pots. I think that's where the flower pot came that was found in my backyard. But there's paths all over behind my house that they walk through where you can see where it's been put down and and the stick structures and the tree snaps that are the markers and that kind of thing. A lot of times at night, we'll be in the living room. And again, the house is built five foot off the ground. And we have a couple of white ones here. The one that is white is actually built more like one of our type humans. I mean, he's well muscled, but he's not massive. And that like a lot of them really are. He actually looks more human. Now his hair is short, but he has hair all over his face. You don't see eyebrows. The only way you see the eyebrows, I've gotten within 10 feet of him. And when you you look at his face, his entire face is hair. And he's got the lighter skin, but he has short, short white hair all over his face. And where the eyebrows are at, it's a little bit longer. So they kind of puff out a little bit. He doesn't have the conial head. He doesn't have the big brow ridge. His face looks almost like a regular one of our humans. And then when you get to the hair on his head, it's slicked back. I don't know why it's slicked back. I don't know how he does it, but it looks almost greased, like it's slicked back all over. His ears are covered in hair. I mean, there's not one part on him until he opens his mouth that is not hair, even if it's just the short hair. I mean, like eight to a quarter of an inch in length. That's really short. And then as it goes down his neck, his neck is very, very muscled just very muscled. And then you go down on his shoulders and his chest and it gets longer, you know, to where it might be an inch, maybe inch and a half long there. But he has this mark on his, remember which arm it is. I believe it's the left arm on the upper between the top of the shoulder and the elbow. And it's like a black strip. I don't know if he was born like that or what, but it's like a little tiny, almost reminded me of a lightning bolt. We have another male here that is absolutely massive. I have a six foot dog kennel and we have a feral dog that's white, unfortunately, because they like the white and she shows up every now and then. And I looked outside and the dog kennel, that particular kennel is actually off to the side in my front yard because it was for a rescue dog that we had and she was out there and he gets between that kennel and all the brush and I've seen him multiple times out there but he's huge he's got to have a good five foot span across his shoulder from one shoulder to the other very muscled I would say he's easily nine foot in height I mean he's a big boy when he stands on the other side of that kennel And I can see that kennel from my window in my bedroom. And it's a six foot kennel. And that is literally on his chest, right at where the bottom of his armpit would be. So he's quite large. And he was out there one night and I heard her barking and then she went quiet. And I got up and I looked out the window. He was, he was holding her. He had her, his, this feral dog that nobody can get near. And he had picked her up and she's got to be 65 pounds, picked her up and he was holding her and he was holding her above the kennel. And he was just a loving on her. And then he sat her down and pretty soon she came running off from around the side of the kennel and ran across the yard and then she disappeared. But he didn't go after her. I mean, he was holding her and then he sat her down and he turned around and went back in all the bushes. But we've had several of them that 
go in and out of these bushes. They love these bushes because they can get in there and nobody knows they're there. And it's not uncommon to walk outside and all of a sudden the bushes start moving and you hear them run off. We had a friend of mine, his name is Dr. John Stamey, and he does a lot of Bigfoot conferences and Comic Cons and he's a promoter. And I met him because Igor wanted to do a conference for him. And Igor had asked me to please contact him about doing a conference that he, he wanted to speak at one of his conferences. So I contacted him and I set it up for Igor. And as we talked, he said, I think, you know, probably a lot about the Bigfoots. And I said, well, I do all right. And so he asked me to speak at his conference and we've been friends ever since, but he came out and he brought a friend of his, which is a professional wrestler named Papa Stro, And he came out and they were supposed to spend the night. And then there was an event that was the next day that wasn't far from here. And they thought it was going to be cool. We're going to see a Bigfoot. And I said, you be careful what you wish for, because I can't promise you'll see him. But if you do, people either freak out or they get overly excited or they never want to come back. So they had went out to the car to get their suitcases. And as they're standing out there, the entire bush has erupted. And literally, these bushes shook so hard. John was terrified. His friend, the wrestler, Rat, his name is, his real name is Rob. And Rob was just like looking at it. And then he was looking at John and he got a bigger kick out, out of seeing John so scared. And they grabbed their stuff and came in the house. And I've had friends that have come over here that have had sightings. I mean, we'll sit on the couch. And when you look from the one side of my living room across the living room and into the sitting area, and then there's windows that look out into the front yard. And they go under the windows and you'll see an arm come up and hit the screen because they think it's funny to scare my cats. And you'll hear them laugh after they do it. They'll, they'll whip their arm up, hit the screen. The cats will go running and then you hear them laugh. They have a very bizarre sense of humor. It's not a mean sense of humor, but it is definitely bizarre and you'll hear them laugh out there and then they'll run off. And so many, many people that have been to my house have experienced that aspect of them because, like I said, they have a twisted sense of humor and they usually think that they're pretty funny. And they'll do that at night. Pat and I will be in our room and he normally will have shades pulled on his window. And then the other window, which is further away from the bed, is the one I always look at and I never cover it up. Years ago, whenever I would try to cover up my windows, they would just have a fit and they'd pound on the house all night long. And I like looking at them. I'll wake up and I'll see them looking in the window. It doesn't frighten me. I don't get scared. I just am more intrigued than anything. And I like being able to look out that window, lay in bed, look out the window. And if they're in the yard, I can see them out there moving around the yard. So I'll wake up and it's not uncommon to have one of the windows blocked out from light. Pat used to leave his uncovered. And one of the ones that I'm extremely, extremely close with, he now is a little over 10, 10 and a half feet in height, very shaggy hair, more on the longer side. He's got hair on his face too, not around his, I mean, his eyes, I don't think there's as much hair and he has a little bit of the brownish skin tones and he has the bulbous nose, but very, very broad, very big, lots of hair. And he was outside that window and he's tall enough now where, like I said before, the top of that window hits 10 foot. He'll stand above it and then he'll crouch down and you'll see his head looking in the window. And I woke up one night and there was no light coming from the one window. And I thought, what in the world? And then I realized what it was. And so I woke Pat up and I said, you get to entertain him. I'm going back to bed. And so I went back to bed and Pat looked over at the window and he just kind of snickered and the Bigfoot did and, and off he walked, you know, and all of a sudden light comes flying in. So Pat put blinds up on his window after that. He said it, it, he's not afraid of them at all. And he doesn't bother when they're looking in the window. But for whatever reason, he's like, I don't want him watching me while I'm sleeping. That's kind of creepy. And I'm like, OK. So he put blinds up. But I have a large garden tub in my bathroom. And right above the garden tub is a big frosted glass window. And it's probably three and a half foot long and two and a half foot tall. So it's quite a large window, but it's actually when you're outside, that particular window is eight to 10 feet 
at the bottom of it's about eight feet off the ground and it'll hit up about 10 feet. They're constantly, I'll be in the bathtub and they can't see through it. It's frosted glass. And while I'm in the bathtub, they tap on that window and they think they're funny. And I'm generally sitting in the bathtub going, I can hear you. I'm ignoring you. It it just doesn't phase me. I mean, not that I don't get scared at times of, of different things, but I would say 99% of the time it doesn't because I already know they're there. I think the only time I get nervous about it is in the dark if when they come up behind me because they've done that before. But I'm like that with anything. If it's dark out, I don't want anything. I don't want the dog coming up behind me. I don't like it. I'm not afraid of the dark, but I don't when I'm outside with them interacting and it's middle of the night. I don't like anything coming up behind me. And they've come up behind me before and put their hand on my shoulder. They've also come up behind me and patted my hair. They like my hair. I have thick hair. It does whatever it wants to do at any given time. And I think it reminds them of their own people just because it's thick and it's long. And so I don't like it when they come up at night. I used to go when I was in Michigan. I went out there every night at 2 o'clock in the morning. They would come to my window and they would chatter and then they would knock and they'd pound until I went outside. And I loved it. I enjoyed it. I would go outside. I'd sit there and they would walk. If I went out in the woods, they would walk around me. Again, not a good idea. You don't ever want to get to where you can be separated from your house, where if you need to get in there, you can get in there. That's what you want. But again, I didn't have anybody to teach me anything because I was just by myself with them my whole life. And so I would go out there and I'd sit on a log and they'd walk around me in a circle. You know, I'd see them going between the trees all around me constantly. And so when I moved here where I'm at now, we have so many snakes. I'm not afraid of being out with the Bigfoots at night. I'm not afraid about being out with the dogmen at night. It's the venomous snakes that I can't deal with. So I don't go out in the woods at night. If I go out with them at night, I go out on my porch. I'll go out on my back deck and... That way they can see me. They know I've gone out there. Um, I can see them moving between the bushes and the trees. Do I have them that walk up to the porch and start talking to me? No, I'm not even going to claim that I do. I had one that did one night. I got woke up in the middle of the night, went outside, and he came up and said what he needed to say, and then he was gone. And that's the only time that's happened in the middle of the night like that. Normally when I go out, I have had back in Michigan when I went out in the middle of the night, they would call my name from the tree line. I mean, I could see them. I absolutely could see them. But as far as are they going to walk right out in the open like that and do that? No. One that I call, I call him Shadow because he follows me all over the place in the woods in Michigan. And he did walk out during the daylight. He came out and he stood within 10 feet of me. So I guess, yeah, I actually have had that happen. He came out. That's how I knew what he looked like. He was the one I described earlier with the shorter white hair and the human looking head. He came out 10 feet from me and just stood there and stared at me. And I stared at him before he turned around and he left. I've had them come and stand right outside the tree line. Do they do it all the time? No. If anybody thinks that they can just go outside and call them, they're just going to show up and, you know, sit down and have a glass of tea with you. That doesn't happen that I know of anyway in my world, maybe for somebody else, but not with me. Do they come forward when they hear me out there? Sometimes, yeah. They like to say where they're still somewhat secluded in the trees, but you can see them. It's not that you can't. Nighttime, they'll get in the bushes and the trees. And my daughter and son-in-law the other night, they were watching from their window of their bedroom, which is a huge mass. It's like a bay window type window in that bedroom. And they would see them on the ground and then they'd see their eyes shine as they climbed up all these huge, massive pine trees and they'd get up in the pine trees and they could still see their eyes shine. We see a lot of eyes shine here, a lot. They flash it constantly in the front, in the tree line where the pine trees are across the street. You get it in the pine trees and the bushes on the side of the house, in the back. It's like a, a free for all. They're, they're running back and forth. They're not damaging anything. They're not causing anybody any harm. They're just having a good time living their lives. I, I've had them at night. If I've driven down the road, I'll see a deer run across. I live on a dirt road. It's almost like a two track 
and they will chase a deer across the road. And generally when they're doing that, they're chasing it towards some of their other people, Bigfoots, so that they can catch this deer. And I've had them jump out from the side, land in the middle of the road, and then leap, and then they jumped back up. First the deer went through, and then the Bigfoot would go through. We get a lot of them. And that tree farm across the street is like 200 acres. It's all privately owned. And there's, you know, other than from the road access, you can't get to it. They have probably got that entire 200 acres plus the other acreage that's back there that's also privately owned. They can come and go as they please. I mean, nobody can get back there. There's no roads back there. And it's all privately owned and and secluded. And then we have not even a mile and a half from here. It's all open fields. And there's this one area where there's cattle in all the time. And there's been five or six of them that different people have seen going in and out of there. And then I have another friend that lives past that. and. When I was over there, I found footprints. She didn't know about the Bigfoots either. And I was like, well, yeah, they're they're definitely here. I've seen the footprints. And I got a glimpse of one when I pulled in her driveway. They just tend to show up. I I, I don't understand it. I People have asked me, well, why you? I don't know. I, I truly, I'm not anything special. I was a housewife, mom, had a thousand animals all the time, just doing my own thing. And they just have always been there as far back as I can remember from when I was three and four years old. My mom talks about when I started learning to talk, always talking about these big, tall, hairy people that followed me everywhere. I mean, I was little. I was born in 64 and you're talking 67, 68. And I wouldn't have had any books that I read about them. They would not have had a program on TV. Patterson and Gimlin hadn't even come out with it yet with Patty. And yet I could tell people about them and I don't understand why. I just know that I could. But I'll get up. I have gotten up early to go somewhere and I'll be pulling out of the driveway. And I've had a couple times now where they ran up and hit the back of the car. Not hard. Just kind of like, hey, wanted to let you know we're here type thing. I really, I just don't get a lot of the aggression from them. But we get a lot of people that when they're here, well, you know, hear them hitting the side of the house or they'll hear those smaller ones get up on the roof. And I know we have babies around here because, like I said, the one now, he's six or seven, but we've heard them. We've actually heard them crying. Last night, they were doing all kinds of calls out there for whatever reason. I was here one night and I had the first one. I had three of them that came up on the side of the property. I went outside to make sure all the dogs were in. Nobody got left out. And there was three standing right next to the fence. And they actually had a cougar. They'll use any type of animal out in the woods as a pet. And they had a cougar. And that kind of took me back a little bit because I was a little bit nervous about that. But they didn't stay long and, and they left. I've seen them about once a year. They come up through the back of the property and they don't usually, I don't think they're from here because I don't see them at all. The neighbor up the road found cougar tracks, but they were a different size from the one that I found here when they visited. And I don't know what they wanted. They just showed up and then they turned and walked off in the woods and they were gone. My husband and I just got back from going to Nebraska. We spoke at the Nebraska Bigfoot Conference in Hastings, Nebraska, and we'll be back there next year as well. And we had great interactions in Nebraska. We were invited to Barry Webster's land in Macy, Nebraska, and could not have been treated better than how they treat us. It was phenomenal. Him and his brother, Derek, and the whole Res Squatching team were there. Kindest people you'd ever want to meet. Wonderful hosts. The property was fantastic loaded with Bigfoot. I mean, just as legitimate as you can possibly be. And I had brought my singing bowl, which is just a Tibetan singing bowl. You can order them off Amazon and they absolutely love it. The noise the brass makes is a higher vibration and they truly, truly love it. And so I brought it and we had a bonfire one night. We only spent one night there and the that day, the night, and then part of the next day. And then we went left. I went back to Hastings and 
we had been invited. That's why we had gone. But I played the singing bowl. And as I was playing the singing bowl, one stepped right out from the tree line there. And there's paths that they have open paths that you could drive or walk on that go through their property. And it stepped right out in the open. I mean, it wasn't shy at all. And it stood there listening to me play the singing bowl. And I sat the bowl down and I got up and I walked about 20 feet towards it because it was probably, I want to say 75 feet away, maybe a hundred feet away when it did it. And it just kind of looked at me and very calmly finished crossing that little path and walked off in the woods. And then there was another one where it had come out of the path that was crouched down and that one stood up, but then it turned around and went back the same way that it had come. So I'd seen them there as well, but a truly amazing experience there. Barry and his brother in the Red Squatch team are just super, super people. Could not have been more legitimate, could not have been more nice, honest, respectful. Just we really enjoyed it. We were very blessed to have been able to go. So then we went back to Hastings and our flight was due to leave and got canceled. So we ended up there an extra four or five days and they were going to go speak at a conference in Colorado. So they took us to Colorado with them, which was wonderful. I've always wanted to go there. And had some great interaction at Estes Park in the mountains. Kenny Collins, God love him, invited us to come see his research area. And we walked up the mountains with him and they were very active up there. We could see different areas where they would run through and you would get a glimpse of them as they were going. There's a red male up there. And so that was absolutely incredible. It just wherever we go, it seems if they're around, it, it seems to happen. And the conference was really nice, met some great people. It was nice to share different experiences that other people have had. And then we came back home and apparently they were glad we were home because they were very loud and boisterous. The night we got back, they were hooting and hollering and and carrying on and having a good old time. But we've just had constant interaction. Like I said, this is something that's gone on my whole life. I mean, as a kid... I would go fishing with a friend of mine and they had a lot of land and they had dug out a pond and they were going to have fish brought in and put in the pond, but they didn't have any yet. And so there was a pond not far from my house and we would go down there and we'd catch fish and put them in water in coolers. And then we transport them to my friend's house and dump them in her pond. And they would be in the tree line. When we would fish, you could hear them. You could hear them doing foot stomps. You could hear branches breaking and they'd make the huffy noise. And then you'd look over there and you'd see them occasionally walking between the trees. You know, they're so subtle that I think people just don't realize that they're even there. My son and law and I were talking about that prior to me doing the show. And he had walked in back and was walking through the woods and he had found some trails that they had made and different tree snaps and things. And we were talking about that. The signs are everywhere if you know what you're looking for. But the signs that they leave are so subtle that if you're just walking through the woods, you probably wouldn't even suspect a thing. But then if you've had contact with them and you know what to look for, it's easier and you realize just how subtle it really is because it's not anything that's sometimes you'll see signs that, you know, like the big giant X's or whatever, and you'll see signs that just pop out and you're like, Oh my gosh, look at that. But also if you go back and further reflect on that and look around and you're like, Oh my gosh, I would never have thought this was a sign. What I do a lot is before it gets dark out, I will go outside, walk around my yard, walk around the house specifically so that that way I can see what's laying on the ground, what isn't laying on the ground, what the trees look like, and just kind of do a mental note of all of these things in the bushes before it gets dark out, before I go to bed. And then the next morning, do the rounds again. I've done that for years and you would be amazed the things that have either been moved around, changed, or either are gone or are now there from the night before. 
whether it be rocks, whether it be X's made on the ground, whether it be changes in the bushes, just it, you'd be surprised when you become that hyper aware what the changes really are. And not everything is a Bigfoot, but a lot of things are. Well, these are all just a few of the many, many experiences that I've had with them and the sightings that I've had and different contact I've had. And I've really enjoyed sharing it with everybody. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I thank you for taking the time to listen. Everybody take care. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down no-horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah.